Hi, uh, my name is Rok Michiot. I'm uh, going to give this presentation about terrain segmentation with uh, label bootstrapping for leader datasets. Um, first, I'd like to just say, if you have any questions, this, this talk was made for GeoPython, uh, so it's maybe aimed towards a bit of a different audience. If you have like more... I think you should mute. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you, you thanks. If you have more, uh, yeah, machine learning uh, interests or so, like just let me know. I'll, I'll cut the geo part and go more towards machine learning if, yeah, if that's more interesting. Um, so yeah, feel free to jump in anytime, uh, and let's get started. Um, so this this is me, circa 1986, uh, about three years old. Uh, exploring some uh, doll lines. Um, so it's an early research interest for me. <laughs> uh, so uh, first, uh, for today's talk, I'm going to talk about what the doll lines are. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, the data source I've used, what I did for labeling it. I'll give a short demo and finally uh, present some results uh, from the entire thing. Okay, so first about the doll line. Um, in Slovenia, it's also known as Kraške uh, Vrtače. Um, so this is a this is a phenomenon that happens uh, on karst. So where you have limestone uh, rock on top of the relief, um, it gets slowly dis dissoluted by uh, rainwater. Um, and even if you start with a flat surface, uh, the the rock will always have some uh, cracks. So if there's more cracks than in other places, the water will tend to go there because it can go through the cracks into the limestone and uh, create bigger cracks. Uh, yeah, kind of reinforcing the, the gradient, right? Uh, and, and making the doll line bigger and bigger. Mm. So you, you start with a semi-flat surface with some, uh, let's say, preconditions in the rock and then slowly uh, along bigger fissures, along bigger cracks, these doll lines will shape. That, that, is the, that is the current understanding of this. Um, this is an example of a cross section. Uh, it, this is in Verd in Vrhnika. Uh, and uh, yeah, doll lines were first described scientifically in 1983 in Lugatets actually, where I'm from. Um, so yeah. Mm, that's that, and uh, that's kind of a qualitative description, but there is no proper quantitative one because there isn't much data about this. Um, yeah, so there's some other options for the genesis of the of the uh, of the lines. This is the one that I was talking about, where where slowly kind of the the top um, rock gets diluted away, but it could be that there was a there was a uh, cave at some point below ground and it, the roof collapsed or there was some soil above the bedrock and it was washed away, etc. Uh, there's many different possible genesis, uh, but kind of always we seem to go towards the same shape. So that's what's interesting about it. Um, because eventually you come to a landscape like this. Uh, this is in Bosnia, um, I think two years ago or so. And you see, like the, this shape really dominates the the landscape. Uh, uh, in Slovenia, we have this kind of landscapes as well, but they're just not visible because of all the forest, because the land is not used in Bosnia. They they um, they graze sheep. I mean, they have a bunch of uh, yeah livestock on these areas. In Slovenia, we just let the forest grow, which is lower intensity, I guess, but but it takes less work. So yeah, it's an economic uh, decision, I suppose. Um, and yeah, for, for something that's so dominant in, in landscape, we really don't understand it very well. Uh, and it has some interesting properties. They, they all seem to be about the same size, the same depth, even if they form in different locations on different rocks, um, which then would you know, suggest uh, there's some sort of physical process there that, that is yeah, universal to, to locations. Uh, this is another uh, picture in Bosnia, and uh, again you see like on the on the flat uh, part here. My mouse is really lagging. 
just look at your screen if you're moving the mouse, it will be... Super yeah, but, but that's not what you see. I mean, I need to optimize for your experience. Uh, so this, the flat area uh, here below is kind of uniform shapes. And then if you go up here in the slope, you see that slowly there's less and less of the lines and they disappear in the in the uh, kind of when the slope is too high or they get like first they get kind of long and weird and then they completely disappear. So there's other factors in play. Uh, so probably the thing needs to be on a, on a flat surface, etc. cetera. Um, right, so now about the data. Um, the data I've used was from a Slovenian leader survey. Uh, you guys probably know about this, yeah. Uh, and the technology used. So basically, they flew, uh, Flycom and some other company uh, flew uh, like, yeah, uh, planes above the surface and scanned it. And we have a point cloud. And uh, the, 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 I guess, the, who, who is this Geodetic Institute or who, who, who is taking care of the data? They were kind enough to provide them, right, the digital elevation model of the agency. All right, agency for environment. Yeah, yeah. Also, okay. So they they provided also the dams. I didn't use directly point clouds um, because I didn't need to. Basically, uh, I just used their dams. Um, and yeah, so this is some statistics about the the scan. Right, um, they they produced. But in the end, they produced this uh, one meter square accuracy. Uh, uh, of 15 centimeters uh, dams that that I ended up using. Um, yeah, there's there's data, there's a report of this about this online, but I'm sure this is not that interesting for you. Or just maybe the the, the, the purple points yeah. are what are then used to construct the, the digital. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. They they did the classification as well. Uh, I guess, I don't know, Ars or Flycom, I don't know. It was Flycom. Flycom, yeah. So... Yeah. Right, so basically they did the classification whether the points in the point cloud are trees, houses, mm -hmm. or, or ground. Maybe they have more classes, but yeah, the dam is basically just the ground class. Um, so this is then what the final leader looks like. Um, so this is yeah the, the dam of Slovenia and with this uh, small uh, outcrop of uh, area of Planinskopolia. This this flat surface here is Planinskopolia, and the area next to it is called Menishia, and the highway between Logatec and Pustojna runs kind of here on the edge of Planinskopolia. I think we we can slightly see it here, but it runs through here through this area. Um, so, yeah, this is one of the densest places with the lines. You can see there's quite a bit of them. Um, yeah, uh, so we wanted to create a catalog of, uh, of the entire Slovenian uh, kind of set of the lines. Uh, we estimated there would be 200k to 1 million of them. So, uh, oh yeah, we should, I should specify we. So I did this in collaboration with Institute of Karst Research in Pustojna. Um, so they had a small budget and I was basically the only one working on this, uh, kind of a freelance setup. Um, so yeah, small budget means not much time, so you can't really go and label this. Uh, and the estimate was it would take about, yeah, full work year to, to manually uh, label all of them if you assume 10 seconds per object. I mean, yeah, just order of magnitude, uh, who knows what then in practice would happen. So, of course, the only option is to go with machine learning. Mm. So the data available from ARSO is uh, ASCII XYZ tiles. Um, so I don't know, probably you can go to them with a the disk, but that's not uh, what I ended up doing. I basically, uh, don't tell them that, scraped their, uh, their uh, URLs uh, to get the, oops, the existing files and downloaded them. Uh, so this was done with uh, Amazon Lambda uh, to, to basically, I passed the, the URLs to Lambda and asked it to dump the files into S3. Um, this took, 
I think like half an hour or so. It was pretty good. Um, so then the, the, these tiles were converted into uh, TIFF, Jukil the TIFF files with uh, GDAL. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with GDAL, right? Uh, yeah. uh, so that was also done on AWS Lambda because I thought, well, it needs to scale. Probably I could have done it on my laptop and might, I would, might have saved some time on that. I don't know. Uh, but it was an interesting exercise. Um, and then post-processing was done with GeoPandas, uh, sorry, post-processing of polygons that were created. So the, the outlines of the lines uh, was done with GeoPandas. And I did some statistical analysis of the raster within the polygons with a package called raster stats. Um, yeah. So that's kind of about the tools. Uh, can I help? Uh, raster stats is uh, from R, it's an R package or is it Python? No, it's Python. Python. Yeah, it's like, I think it's basically one developer uh, doing it. It's not super well known, but it does the thing. So basically you pass it a shape and a raster and it then you can calculate arbitrary NumPy things on the raster which is pretty interesting, for, at least it was for me. Um, so this is then like a 3D uh, dem, right, of the lines. And I don't know, like for me, this was a bit, yeah, uh, not useful for, for labeling because uh, the idea was, okay, we need to, yeah, we need to put polygons around all of them. This is not a good interface for a human to see and, uh, and to label because it's in 3D, so we had to look for other options. Mm. So, uh, yeah, on the left is basically a shade, not a shaded, uh, kind of like a continuous uh, color map of the altitude. Um, so that is okay for kind of seeing without any kind of strange things happening to the data but it can be problematic if you have a high altitude uh, difference in one tile. So uh, here, I mean, it, it's kind of good for reality checks, but it's not useful for, for labeling, uh, let's say a thousand tiles. So we didn't use that, uh, but that was the raw data. Uh, we ended up using the hill shaded relief. So that was produced with, uh, with uh, GDAL. I forget the parameters, but basically it's just a shaded version of this. Um, it's not perfect because sometimes you see these things as con concave and sometimes as convex. I don't know what you see right now, but I see them, I see the objects as coming out, so convex. And it's not ideal. And uh, I think it has to do also with like where the light is in, your, in the room where you currently are. It's basically a transformation your brain does. Uh, so it's really, it's not ideal, but but it's better than anything else I tried. Um, and yeah, the final output was this label mask. So basically polygons that are separate um, can be used uh, to do statistics on. Uh, so the idea was then basically this is the raw data. You use the, these to label, then you do uh, machine training. I mean, you do training on this data with the created labels and you try to predict these uh, out, right, for the whole country. Um, so <clears throat> the data set is quite diverse. These are some examples of, uh, of these things. And uh, yeah, probably you realize this better than me that uh, this is a bit uh, of a scale problem. You have to have good tooling to, to approach this. So um, yeah. Uh, I checked the tools a bit. Um, so these were mostly not available before the project started. The, the, the labeling in machine learning is actually, uh, this space is developing very fast. So um, let me show you what I mean. The, the first one, uh, this label studio uh, is like a startup in San Francisco. And they're trying to do like an open source framework to build, um, um, how to call this, uh, not homogeneous, but the other one. Uh, uh, no, 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 like the opposite of homogeneous, uh, heterogeneous, yeah. Heterogeneous data sets, right? So, uh, I mean, they're trying to do like a general framework 
for for very heterogeneous data. So uh, they have some examples here. Uh, so let's see. This is like a demo of how would a label classifier for some objects look like. So this is like an airport, and I can label cars, right? And then in the end, output would look like this, right? So I just created the label. I can, I guess, I can create another one. No, oh, yeah. come on. Yeah, so there's another one. And basically, the designing of the interface is like this. Uh, so you can say, uh, I don't know, something. Wood? Road. Road, yes. And the background can be blue. <coughs> and now I have, uh, oh, wow, typing, yeah. So now I can label a road here, right? So they, they make this nice framework to, to enable this. Um, and they have also audio, uh, audio and text uh, stuff. Um, so this is an interesting kind of thing, uh, like framework for producing labels. So if you need to to have a, like a flexible approach to things, this is one way to go. It's open source, and I think they want to do an ecosystem around it, business-wise. Another one is Prodigy. This is more of a business thing, but it's also like a Python package, and then they promise to do some sort of active learning thing. So they learn from examples as you go, and then they help you more. And Amazon Cloud Truth is right, the corporate option of all these uh, things. Uh, so none of these were available when I was starting. Uh, so I ended up with VIA, which is a VGG image annotator from this VGG group in, uh, I think, Oxford. Uh, it's like a JavaScript framework to, to do these things. When did you start? Uh, in, I think, end of 15. Or, no, wait, wait, sorry. Uh, end of 17, probably. Something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it must have been, let's see, if I go back, I did this presentation in the summer, and I finished it around New Year's before, so, yeah, I was working in 18, so I started at 19, I think, probably, yeah. And in, end of, uh, sorry, end of, yeah. Okay. Um, good. So let me show you a, an example of how this looked like. Uh -oh. I need to let, me... okay. let this download. Um, so a bit about these tools then. Uh, so I, I ended up using uh, VIA to produce JSON labels. Uh, that I then had to transform into binary masks um, that I would train on and so. So it was also good. I mean, the, 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 the interesting part then becomes like uh, managing your data, not so much the actual machine learning or so, but that actually you get into engineering pretty fast, right? I, I guess you guys are familiar. Uh, so getting the data in and out and all those integration cases suck a bunch of time. So, um, yeah. Okay. So this is an example of how the labeling looked like. Um, uh, let's see. Yes. So uh, via two is basically an HTML file, and you can and it has JavaScript integrated. Uh, into it that helps you with labeling. I mean, it does this logic for labeling. Um, you can also embed uh, images as byte strings into the HTML, so it makes it kind of portable. So, um, yeah, I, I helped some people, I, I asked some people to help for a couple of these. So, I would basically just send them this HTML page uh, and they would send me back the JSON annotation. So, basically, they could draw stuff. Uh, let's see. The thing. Oh yeah. So you can draw different things, and then you you save as JSON and you send this JSON. And oops, 
So it's kind of like the simple JSON per region. You have a label and then some attributes and whatever. Nothing, nothing too crazy. Um, just a way to store labels. Um, so this was done manually um, for about 1,000 tiles in total. Um, and to, to help with the moving data around, I created a small library and I open sourced it and you can try it, but I wouldn't necessarily advise to, to build something off of it. Um, it's just not, I mean, there's better ways now with all those other tools that I showed. Um, but yeah, maybe to, to steal some ideas, it's good. So uh, this is like a demo of the thing then. Um, basically I'm using TensorFlow to uh, the data set uh, logic to, to store the data. That's why I'm importing it here and I'm doing some custom stuff. So here, for instance, I have two images locally um, and I want to create this a via file with these images embedded uh, and I want to store it and then send it to somebody or so. So I run this, right? So I create a, an image set I add the images in, and then I create Im uh, via file, and then I just copy out the link so I can download it. So then this is the this thing. Uh, I can draw stuff here, and then I you know uh, export uh, notation as JSON, and that's that. So I could basically on disk create these sets. Um, then the interesting part is when you have three people, let's say. Uh, hypothetically label these things for you, then you need to join these sets together uh, and so on. So I implemented some logic around that, how to kind of concatenate uh, labeled sets and so on. So that's something that's in the package. Um, here then I load the, the JSON that was uh, labeled and I store it as TF, uh, TensorFlow records. So as kind of binary masks. Um, and then I plot these out, right? So I plot the, the images in the, in the record plus the masks. So this is how it looks like. I mean, this is not what we did there in the, in the JSON thing, but let's say we did proper labels, then this is what it would look like in TensorFlow. And this is then immediately useful for training. Um, and so let's pretend there was a training set step here and then we produced uh, predicted uh, records. So then we would just read them, uh, read these new labels in and create a v new via with, uh, with, the, with these labels. So then kind of the machine learning predictions would look like this. They would not be uh, like circles or whatever anymore, but they would be polygons. And then what I would do is then review these predictions and correct them uh, as needed. So yeah, uh, if you if you have this kind of needs, like feel free to go through this label wrapper package. Um, there's I think there's a couple of good ideas, but there's especially the TensorFlow part that would just get rid of now. Uh, TensorFlow is going a weird direction. So um, yeah. I have a question on that. Sure. Um, regarding the label. So in the uh, labeling campaign, you always drew circles. Yeah. But at the end, you don't have circles. So yeah. Uh, so you started with a circle? Yeah, I started with circles because, I mean, if you look at the example label data sets in the industry, uh, like they always just draw bounding boxes. And I think they just rely on the models to figure out the actual segmentation. Uh, Right. This Sometimes the, 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 the model is trained to predict the bounding box. So yeah. This could also be an option here. I don't know if it's useful, but. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know how do they, do they, when they predict bounding boxes, I'm not sure if it goes directly to a bounding box or does it go to a mask that, that's somehow converted into a bounding box. 
Um, I didn't look much into that, but if it's possible to go directly to a bounding box, right? Yeah. But I, I went direct, I went to masks, and then I had some custom logics, kind of classical machine uh, computer vision logic to go from from the masks into uh, into bounding polygons. Um, yeah, so honestly, it worked. Uh, and the idea was we start with circle because it's the easiest to do, right? Mechanically, you just point at the center and draw and pull, and when you're happy, you release. Uh, alternatively, drawing polygons is super uh, laborious. And I don't know even how to stop it then. God. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that it was basically, uh, I, I, there was no time to properly explore what's the influence of not having uh, exact bounding boxes, but I, it worked out pretty well. Yeah. It's nice to see. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Um, so then about the model that I used for predictions, uh, so going from, um, uh, going from the masks to, uh, I mean, training on masks and images and then going to predicted masks. Uh, it was basically UNAT, which was, uh, I think, authored in 2015. There was a paper uh, by a group uh, in Freiburg or somewhere in Germany. Um, and the idea is basically that, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with deep learning. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm not, I know enough to be dangerous, not enough to really properly explain it, but uh, basically it's a couple of uh, convolutions. Uh, so you start with an input image here. It's, I think here it's one channel. Um, and you go and you uh, convolve into another uh, image that's half the size. I mean, it's if it was 256 by 256, then it's 128 by 128. And then and you go down until you're, I think, here it's 32 by 32. Um, so you kind of push, I mean, you, you decrease the resolution. And the idea is that you kind of uh, compress the information in this process. And then you have deconvolution steps. Uh, uh, I mean, sorry, um, what are these called? Um, Upconf, whatever. So basically, you make one, out of one pixel, you make four pixels when you go back up. And you always also carry over the same layer. So kind of like you're compressing and bringing it back. But here you're also bringing the layer of the same size from the start together. And you kind of, yeah, this helps to kind of bring in the global, more global information, this, this step here. And these ones are kind of on local information. I mean, on the pixel level information, you bring in uh, data. That's kind of the, 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 the intuition. It seems to work. <coughs> um, yeah, and it worked very well for, for, uh, for segmentation of bio biomedical stuff. So like uh, uh, cell bound, uh, bounds and so on. And I thought, well, the data looks similar. Um, let's try it, and it worked fine. It would be nice to try some other other models as well, but uh, this worked pretty good, and there was not time to do others. Um, uh, now, because the, the 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 whole exercise was to stretch the the little work we had time for. As much as possible, we also did documentation of the data. Uh, so basically, um, if you feed the, the model the same data all the time, right, it will overfit, and you can only get so far with a small data set. But you can really nicely stretch it if you slightly augment the image. So like, let's say you do elastic deformations, you slightly deform the things, but the model is still able to, I mean, so it's kind of a different data, but not really. And uh, the model lear learns to generalize better and it makes it more robust. And so otherwise it would kind of learn, you know, these exact places, but not the others. This way you kind of make it generalize. These are the augmentations we used. So different flips and rotations, a bit of zoom in, zoom out, 
uh, elastic trans uh, deformations and grid distortions. So yeah, basically just trying to stretch out the data set as much as possible. Uh, and we, we had, uh, at the end we had uh, about a thousand uh, tiles, so a thousand square kilometers labeled. Uh, so here's a bit about the, the approach we used. So we did uh, active learning, which is uh, basically you train, the idea is uh, active learning is a general idea in machine learning, it's not limited to deep learning. Uh, you, you train an algorithm you, and you predict with it, but you also kind of monitor um, its confidence uh, with the prediction. And if the confidence is too low, then you review the, the, um, the results and you feed them back into the training set and then you retrain, right? It's kind of the idea. Um, so what we did, we took like a training batch of let's say 100 tiles, we manually labeled them uh, and uh, we got the first labeled set and we trained on it to go get the first model. And then we took a second batch, which was different than the first batch. There was no overlap. We predicted on it and we got the predicted set one, let's say, and we reviewed those labels. And there were of course errors in this because yeah, 100 labels, I mean, 100 tiles is not that great. There's not, uh, there were errors. Uh, we fixed the label set, we reviewed it and fixed the labels. And we got the label set uh, number two and we kind of concatenated it with label set number zero, and we trained a new model. So now the, there was a double amount of uh, training data. And we repeated the process until we got to about 1,000 uh, square kilometers, I mean square tiles. Um, and what uh, to say here, we, we felt that the, the error was getting good enough that it wasn't an issue anymore. I mean, luckily, Slovenia is still kind of, yeah, uh, limited, I mean, a finite uh, data set, and there's only so much data to look at, you can kind of high over glance over it and, you know, fix the obvious problems and be done with it. I mean, this, yeah, it was an academical exercise too, so no customers screaming at you later. Um, so this was good enough. Sorry, two questions. Mm -hmm. this thousand um, squares. Yeah. Uh, what is the fraction of the overall? Uh, Slovenia has about 20,000 tiles, and I think maybe half of that, or two thirds, is cast. So it's potential targets, but yeah, we just ran it on the whole thing. It was no need to think. That's uh, a considerable, let's say, reduction. But yeah, so 5%. In the beginning here, you mentioned that you monitor the confidence of the model. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Uh, so you can develop your own metric, right? For us, it was basically kind of like, uh, uh, is this good enough or not? Kind of a qualitative uh, human estimate. Uh, so you will just get, take the predictions and you yeah. look at them, yeah. fix them, and uh, you repeat this until you say, no, yeah. now it looks fine. Yeah, exactly. When you don't need to fix many anymore. So this, this manual step here, review labels, mm -hmm. it was purely human, uh, but you could, you could be smarter about this. You could, we could have like a validation set, right? Uh, we probably should have, yeah. Uh, I mean, but then again, for a bigger project, that, that would definitely be a, a way to go. Yeah. Two questions? That works. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of like, uh, uh, like a manual uh, yeah, labeling and then kind of the outcome. Uh, later. Uh, this is uh, close to Lugat. It's, I think this this here is the highway. Um, so you see that the, the circles, uh, yeah, become nice polygons. Uh, of course, it's not perfect. Um, I mean, obviously, they sometimes you miss pixels. Uh, then, for instance, here, you have multiple objects uh, kind of concatenated into one, uh, kind of like a peanut shape, uh, like this ones. So we, we solve this later in post-processing with a watershed swim, uh, segmentation, and some of them we just fixed by hand. Um, yeah, I, I think like in any exercise like this, basically in the end you have some manual work. I don't think you can, we're not there yet. I mean. 
uh, with machine learning, who knows if it will ever be, but then again, the error rate can be quite good. Um, and some, some objects were missed, for instance, this one here, uh, like it's missed. But then again, yeah, or, or this one here. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think I have another one. Yes, this is another area. It's, this one is slightly rougher, I mean, in terms of uh, the difficulty of the terrain. Um, yeah, you, uh, when you look at these things for a while, you really start to doubt everything. So. <laughs> I mean, is this is this out or in? You know, should these things be one object or many objects? There's so many questions. It's uh, it's yeah. There's cognitive work that's not uh, that. Uh, let's say you can't really dismiss it. There's probably eight hours plus, well, more probably of manual reviewing and work, and it's not uh, the easiest. And also because you kind of make you're making a decision what the model should do, and it's not clear how this will play out in the long run, and you know it's a black box in the end. You don't know what's going to happen. Mm. So yeah, there's that. Um, now, the the final, uh, I mean, the training and inf inference of these things. Uh, so we had about 1,000 tiles, which is about one GB of data. On laptop, it took 30 hours to converge the, the unit uh, model that we had. Uh, I tried the TPU's version 2 that came out at the time, so that's the Google's hardware, this thing. Um, it's like a specialized uh, tensor processing unit. I guess that's what the name, TPU, yeah. Um, so it took about eight, eight hours to converge there, and it's nice because then you don't hear the fan of the laptop going crazy. Uh, does your laptop have a GPU or? It does, and it's and I, I put Ubuntu on it, and the drivers are crap because it just keeps running the fan. And actually, like it overheated, and my um, battery got bloated. So you can see the touchpad like, being a bit weird. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah. So I mean, otherwise good laptop, but this is horrible. Uh, yeah. But I'm surprised that the, the speed up is not. Yeah. More. In the laptop, and it, the, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, uh, it could be that I was not optimally supplying data to it or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. And the budget for this was I got the free whatever coupon at the beginning of 300 euro and I didn't spend it. Uh, I don't know how much it was in the end because I started with uh, Colab, which gives you free TPUs. And then I switched over to the um, to the command line stuff uh, in their console, which was a bit easier to to set up and do. Um, and yeah, it wasn't expensive. I, I guess if you have a bigger data set, it's different. Uh, surprisingly, inference was more difficult because you have this data set that you need to ch uh, drag along, and then the output is not exactly fitting into memory either. Um, so on the laptop, I didn't even try it. I didn't have space, and so. But on the TPU, it took very fast. It was very fast. It took one hour to to inference. So I think that also they optimize for inference, not training so much, maybe, uh, because this is the the main thing for them, right? I mean, Google basically did, they did some estimates at some point that if they want to run deep learning on everything, they need like a new class of hardware. Otherwise, they're gonna run out of computers. And, so I think this is like, uh, yeah, their, their focus is inference, not training, I think. Uh, okay, post-processing, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, well, it was basically cutting up these masks into uh, shapes. And this is also annoying because, yeah, the masks are not georeferenced, so you have to cut them up to polygons and uh, give them coordinates. So there's a lot of this engineering uh, yeah, you never do pure data science. It's always 90% of wrangling with data. Um, yeah, and, oh yeah. The interesting part was also the model does not uh, treat the pixels the same if they're in the center of the image or outside, just because the convolutions. Um, yeah, that's how they work, right? I mean, if you convolve the edge of the tensor, you uh, you're gonna save the output of that 
one convolution step into the central pixel usually. Uh, so that means that the edge pixels will not be convolved in this way, so you're going to kind of average them locally or so. So yeah, you're losing that information a bit. Uh, so what I did is then I did like an overlapping predictions and then I composed one tile out of these overlaps. Um, that, and that's what you have to do, I think, in any case, if you work with tiles and you can't uh, in the wild work with, uh, you, you can't put the whole country into one model, right? It doesn't work. Um, Okay, um, yeah, it can all be done with Google Colab for free. Uh, TensorFlow is problematic. Come on, Let's, how do I get rid of this thing? Yeah, call it the central grid. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, TensorFlow can be difficult, but it's getting better. I'm not sure this is true anymore. I think it's getting worse. Uh, so I, I would, if I would tr start now, I would start with uh, PyTorch or uh, FastAI. I don't know if you're familiar. FastAI is like a higher level thing that's now completely switching to, uh, to PyTorch. Um, I mean, I hear that most researchers go for PyTorch these days because it's faster to iterate. Uh, but then, kind of for deployments or so, TensorFlow is popular because it's more uh, engineered. So, I don't know. But for pro project like this, uh, this is probably not an issue. Uh, Just because we need to run yeah. the inference once. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, this is like, it's a very different thing because, yeah, as I said, it's a finite set. So, yeah. but yeah, if you're gonna, I don't know, classify points every other week, then then you really need to think a bit differently. Okay, um, so these are some of the results. Uh, we identified, uh, yeah, 471,082 objects. Uh, these are these are histograms of diameter by region. So the regions are arbitrary, just decided by ours, I guess. Uh, they don't have so much to do with natural conditions. Um, and you can see that yeah, the, the the peaks of the histograms are different. So there is there is a difference. I mean, there are factors at play that change the the average size. So so it's interesting. Uh, there's stuff we can do with this. Um, and average diameter is 42, which is also nice. Uh, <laughs> obvious reasons. <laughs> Um, you have to tweak. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's actually pretty close to this, but I'm I'm sure if like I yeah, it would be easy to show something else. <laughs> it's data. I mean, you 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 do things to it until it shows what you want, right? So, um, yeah, and this is kind of like uh, what the final result looks like. Uh, this is Kucheria region, right? And Kolpa, you can see the Kolpa Canyon. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it's it's nice and like for instance this area here you can see there are some geological things going on or so and here the the area must, is much flatter so they're more u uniformly distributed um, yeah so that's one of the results let's I have some more stuff to show maybe um, or maybe maybe go to questions now and then I show more stuff. Uh, I mean, wait, I have this. Um, so this on the left, it's kind of like the raw, uh, colors are crap, but on the left it's raw altitude data. Uh, then the second column is uh, predictions. Uh, so you see it's more fuzzy. And then uh, the third column is kind of a cutoff and it's the mask that we, we get out, I mean, that we then do stuff on. And then the third is probably segmented, but I'm not sure what this is. And uh, wait, the third is post-processed, or I, I think it is, yeah. But but it's not labeled, so it's not different colors. Usually, you can do different colors. So I don't know what it is. I don't remember now. Sorry, uh, but huh. yeah, probably it's probably it's like thrown. Out, I probably threw out the small dots, and on the edges. Stuff on the edges, I don't know. What kind of post-processing was that? Mm, so basically, uh, 
there's this region props command, I think it came from Atlab or somewhere else, and it's also in scikit image, and you basically do like, uh, it does segmentation per, per this, per, uh, per this joint set of pixels, right? You say like, this is my mask of ones and zeros, and then it says, okay, uh, these, these pixels are stuck together, and I set it to value one, and these are a separate one, value two. And then you have basically an array of, of these integer values, and you can just address it with Boolean wise. Yeah. Um, and this is more uh, feature engineering stuff. Um, so it's something I didn't mention. The, the input for the model was basically poor altitude data. Uh, it was it was uh, normalized in the in the model because the models don't take like you know zero to two thousand uh, integers, but rather you need to normalize to to something else. I forget now whether it's within a uh, natural exponent or within one. I don't know. Um, so this is the raw input. Uh, these are. I think concavities with a small, uh, with a small uh, convolution kernel. These are a bit greater convolution kernel, and this is the biggest convolution kernel. This is probably like 60 meters or so convolution kernel. So you can see like that uh, concavities. Let's say here, here you can see small concavities better. Here larger areas are more pronounced, and here even larger. Um, and so the idea was we, I would use four channels and throw them into the model, and maybe that's more information for the model to use uh, to make a better prediction. But turns out the model doesn't care. Uh, and actually, I got better predictions out of just feeding in raw data. Makes sense, because it does convolutions anyway. Inside. Yeah, yeah. It can learn it, yeah. I, I guess, right? I guess this just introduces error. I don't know. It, it, yeah, it's horrible because it's all a black box, but, uh, but then again, it works really nice. Um, so these are, I guess, kind of probability predictions, and these are masks. Yeah, so that's kind of the same. Um, yeah, this is the idea about uh, that maybe active learning uh, makes your, uh, makes you, better use your data set, right? Maybe you can reduce the amount of data you need to label uh, to, to get to the final result. Uh, yeah, I don't know. This is not based on data. I think this is just an idea. Um, good. Now, um, I have some more stuff I can show here. Um, kind of like I can show stuff about Amazon, I can show stuff about working with shapes and pandas. Um, I have the model code here. I don't know, um, what would you like to, to hear about? Do you have questions? I have a question about the watershed algorithm you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, could you explain it a bit different? Yeah. Uh, so watershed, See what it does. You have this mask, and it calculates the distance of uh, zero pixels uh, from, yeah, the distance to the closest zero pixel, right? So it creates this gray shade here, and then um, I think it does. Does it say? Basically, you already. I mean, this image already answers my question. So yeah. This is actually you're speaking the two. Of them. I mean, yeah. one log into two. Uh, this is then you, and for for um, you created polygons out, right? Yeah. Um, so what what did you use to to trace the outline then? Uh, the outline was traced by GDAL. Uh, trace. Uh, so I was looking at it earlier. This one. Um. Yeah, so basically I would read the masks uh, with NumPy. No, wait, what, what happened? Oh, yeah, so it took the data from memory. Um, it would create a raster and then um, 
Yeah, okay, no, I'm not sure I can interpret this right now, but basically it's this polygonized thing. Um, so I, I guess yeah, it's okay. it's pretty well documented. Yeah, okay. And, and here, I'm not sure how exactly it determines the kind of this shallow uh, situation, but again, well documented. Uh, questions? Uh, I, usually people ask about uh, the uh, precision, I mean, or the error rate, but I asked this already twice. <laughs> yeah, but you said you didn't have a validation. Yeah, so, uh, and they suggested I do uh, intersection over union, and that's what I plan to do. Um, so basically, I will split out a validation set that will be, like, really well vetted by humans, and then I'll, I'll predict on it and check the, the error. That's the plan. I mean, the, the entire um, problem is very similar to load or building um, segmentation. Yeah. And there are quite a lot of few nice blog posts on um, building um, segmentation in SpaceNet. And mm -hmm. there is a no, they provide also open package Python library where you can, where they already implemented all of the mm -hmm. metrics. So probably you just provide the mask or even the vector output that you have. And it will calculate the uh, metrics for you. What's the name of the package? Um, Solaris. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> How did this one? Uh, Solaris and Cosmic Works. This was not right, this one. It was? Yeah, yeah it was. Okay. Uh, there's some GitHub repository. There should be a home page, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is it. Let's see the docs. Okay, I'll check, uh, check it out. Nice. Uh, I mean, it turns out that, you know, just having a model and do stuff is actually the easy part. Like, <laughs> that's really, yeah, the hard part is getting the data there and then back. Uh, that's the hard part. I mean, if you do images, at least there's one step less. With geo stuff, you have to go back to geo reference and so on, yeah. Uh, and it's like a one giant canvas. It's not like a limited scope, right? You lose um, geo. Uh, you don't lose the geo information. So you, for your tile or mm -hmm. the input you to your model, you know you have a geo reference. Or... Yeah, so I take... Uh, the, the, the uh, TIFFs, I take out the raster layer and store it as a NumPy array, and then I create out of the NumPy array, I create this bounding, uh, sorry, training chunks, where I have like the, the, um, the masks and the data, and then I throw that into training. And then when I get it out, I, I need to keep the information of what's the name of the chunk or the ID of the chunk, and then I have to bring it back into TIFF and attach the geo coordinates to it. Uh, so, I, yeah, it's, it's a bit involved. I mean, uh, a nice exercise to learn something about engineering. Uh, but it's, not, yeah, you spend a lot of time on this because the tooling is not there. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, like, uh, I think you guys might be interested in the... Lambda, so this is like uh, the downloader code. Let me see this. Um, oops. Okay. So this is the entire thing. Uh, it instantiates a bottle client to S3. Uh, it gets a URL and destination bucket from uh, yeah, from whatever runs it, and it basically uh, it opens a stream, uh, yeah, with requests to to get the data, and it pushes it into into client, into so into S3, uh, and yeah, an example. Yeah, here's an example. Test. I right, basically. Yeah, okay, this is not uh, correct, but I could test it just by clicking this. It would run, and of course, it would fail. Um, so this is like an example of this lambda, and I was using it via, uh, what is it, gateway? 
Uh, no, API Gateway. Uh, so I, I created an endpoint um, that I can call. Uh, so I have to post again, uh, the URL against it. Um, is it here? Where is this thing? Jesus, okay. Uh, I can show how it looks like maybe. Um, so you post the URL and it activates the Lambda, which downloads it. Yeah. So it's this thing here. What is the cost per? So first million calls are free. First million. Yeah, but then it also calculates the runtime. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing gridding of the of the raster, so like it took seconds. So then it added up, and I think I paid like 20 euro or something in the end for the whole country. Um, but again, it's a small country, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't always work. Um, there's optimizations, and there's also an option to basically run your own uh, Lambda infrastructure, I mean, basically your own uh, 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 server that executes, I think, is it FAS? Yeah, so you have this open FAS thing where you basically, you, you have your own server, uh, your own servers, and uh, you 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 send uh, lambdas to them, and geez, they execute for you. But uh, but you could also do this. Can it the, the point or, because or um, EC2 instance for them. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, this is nice if you have like a lot of different things that you want to do, but maybe you don't do them in big batches yeah, yeah, yeah. or something like. There's cases where you want something like this. For me, it was interesting because I didn't want, uh, for downloading, it's interesting definitely because I, I could parallelize, right? So if you look at, this is the, the download command I ran, uh, and I timed it, and it took like 40 seconds to send all the commands for the whole country, I think. Uh, and then it was, it was downloading for half an hour, and then all the calls stopped, and the data was there. The so, Slovenian server didn't ban you. I was, was, yeah, I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's an on-prem thing, and I, I seem to remember it was something Microsoft, some sort of Microsoft server uh, from 404s that I was seeing. Uh, so probably they, they noticed the bandwidth spike, maybe, but nothing else. Yeah. Um, so basically, here I have different calls that I was running against this API, and yeah. What was the size of each um, request that you made? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, data sent? Yeah. I mean, it's basically these parameters sent, right? So it was the bucket, the SRS, I mean, the, the coordinate system, the, the location of the input, uh, the name of the file, and the output folder. So that's all I sent, because the data was already in S3. It was just picking up data from S3, processing it, and putting it in another folder in S3. What was the wait, what was the size of the final data set? Like 20 giga? Yeah, I set? think so. I think uh, that was the, the stuff I was training on anyway. Mm -hmm. Or no, sorry, predicting on. I did resize. I didn't do full resolution. I did. Uh, I went down to one square meter resolution because the tiles. The, on the the height, or wasn't it the uh, one meter resolution? Anyway? No, so it, it, the dials are one kilometer by one kilometer, but I went to 265 by 265, so basically I resized down, because that's what the model takes. Uh, otherwise, it gets a bit computationally too much. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I could have just cut up the tiles into four. That would make for better uh, Ah, so you just resized them. Yeah. So your prediction was roughly on four meters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say definitely the more time you have to tweak and play with these things, the better the results will get. So I, I didn't have that much time. I, basically, the way the project looked like, I was doing this like in the evenings, not every day, for six months or so. And then I had like, in between jobs, I had two, three months to work on really. Um, that's that's the time I had. So when you sum all your work together, are you still under one menu? 
<laughs> yeah, still, still, but uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, it's very cool. Huh? It is, yeah. And I mean, and if I use it for something else, I've learned this now, so then I can scale myself. Earlier, I would just keep on grinding. Um, so the model is this is the unit here. Um, I don't know, yeah, let's not go into this, it's not re very readable. Um, maybe I find this interesting kind of, uh, so I, I did, I'm now doing, uh, um, I'm doing some statistics. I, how familiar are you with GeoPandas? Yeah? Ah, okay, so then, yeah, then this is not maybe that interesting. I mean, or, or maybe we can compare notes. So these are the, I want to map uh, the, these dot lines to certain areas. So I have these polygons. Uh, I can plot them, I guess. Um, so I have these polygons that I want to map the dot lines into. Um, so uh, these are then the, if I do, I did a spatial join here. So I have uh, the areas here and these are, uh, I'm reading the, the, this, the total file of the, the dot lines. Uh, I'm calculating diameters and then I do, um, where's the, uh, here's the special join. So basically if, uh, if the dot line is within the area, then assign, uh, and yeah, then merge it. Um, so then individual areas look like these. Um, maybe this is interesting, uh, right? So there's quite a bit of this stuff. Uh, so then I did some uh, histograms on on size again, I guess, what is this? Diameter, yeah. So I'm looking, I'm trying to do statistics per different regions. So these regions are now picked by an expert to where we expect differences uh, in, in the way the dollar is formed. So I'm looking at these things and yeah. Um, I don't know, typical, uh, yeah, panda stuff. Okay, then, then this is not maybe that interesting. Uh, let me show you the, the kind of the final results. Um, I mean, the, the final goal was just to create a map or was it to, here? Uh, uh, I mean, the goal of the project. Yeah, yeah. the, uh, the final goal is to produce a catalog of these objects, uh, like polygons around them, so that we can do statistics and understand a bit you know, if it's on a different rock or in a different area, will that change the way it looks like? Because maybe that can tell us something about uh, what influences its growth and the final size. Because it seems that they are everywhere where you have flat limestone, they appear. Um, and they, the, the flat limestone appears in Slovenia in different times. But they always end up being about the same size, the same shape. So that means that they're kind of a... Um, what do you call this? Um, uh, stabilna, stable form, uh, like that forms after a certain time, right? So it's uh, equilibrium form, right? So that means that there is a dynamic um, equation there uh, that that would uh, bring you to this same equilibrium form, uh, and maybe we can now think about it more, and produce something. Uh, so if I zoom in, for instance, into Kras here, oops, um, go away. So maybe this is better. So this is uh, Kras, and um, yeah, you can see there's a bunch of objects. Um, I we calculated the statistics per object. So kind of the minimum altitude, maximum altitude, median, whatever, uh, parameter, uh, sorry, parameter, perimeter uh, stuff as well, area, um, centroid volume, right? So these, are, these were calculated with raster stats. And uh, this is what I was using for the histograms earlier. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that uh, in the, the the first two pictures that we showed, mm -hmm. um, you said that uh, they seem to have different characteristics based whether they're on flatlands or yeah. on slopes. 
Did you do any stratification in that regard? Yeah, that's what I'm uh, going to do actually this week. I, I think yeah, this was an op it's an open question, and mm -hmm. I'm going to look at it. Uh, so the idea is to just calculate slope with GDAO and then do this. Yeah. Great. You have LIDAR, right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It should be easy indeed. Yeah, that's something I'm doing definitely. Oh. One comment. So when when you calculate the area with geopandas. Mm -hmm. I think you need to be careful because, at least from what I understand, GeoPandas is not aware of the projection in which your data is, but simply calculates yeah. the area of polygon of the geometry, yes. coordinates. So, so if you're case, lucky, you're doing So in case you, your polygons are not in the projection which preserves the areas, then yeah. you end up with the wrong number. I, you can change this stuff. Uh -huh. yeah. So, I, I, but I'm not sure whether the the projection I have this in is preserving the area. Transverse Mercator, right? It's the uh, mm -hmm. E96, I think. Let's see. So it yeah, it's uh, 3794. So yeah. Uh, mm. I'm not sure. I, uh, this is something I need to look into. Uh, no, I think it's not preserving the area. So. Oh, you should. Uh, I'm not how I'm not sure how Aristotle does that. Mm, I so I didn't use it for area. Oh. Okay. I used that's that's geopandas. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Mm, doesn't say. I think it's important so it preserves the shapes. Mm. And the, uh, yeah. Do you, I mean, do you plan to, do you have some projects open where you want, want to do something like this? Just no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole time I was thinking, why don't we have LIDAR data? <laughs> no, not really, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, not you, you had it uh, nice, but uh, yeah, Working with uh, you're you're basically working with um, grayscale images, right? Yeah, basically. Um, it does it does affect a little bit because the, the satellite data that we're we oh, yeah. we are using, I mean, they, they have uh, uh, you get uh, different differences in reflectances, so some of the images are darker, some of them, some of them are lighter. Atmospheric correction, yes, no, and yeah. we're still, um, we will have to explore that part as well. How much does it influence? And yeah, well, it really is, uh, but what's your ground truth? I mean, your labeling or <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> we, we have labeled data, but yeah. it's incomplete. <laughs> nice, yeah, that's a nice word. I mean, not incomplete, it's <laughs> It's missing a lot of the data. It's real, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for buildings, there was a Kaggle competition, right? Uh, Several competitions, yeah. 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 But okay. In the end, it's never. I mean, yeah, our yeah. plan is to actually try some of the already made models. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think most of them actually do pretty good. Uh, yeah, resolution is high resolution, very high resolution, mm -hmm. either drawn um, or air, um, aerial imagery mm -hmm. or again VHR uh, satellite. And we have what, one meter and a half? Yeah, half meter. Data sets in competitions are usually cleaned up and everything, so everything yeah. is yeah, near to perfect. Yeah. Um, real life, as you said yourself, is <laughs> you, 90% of the time you deal with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even here, we probably had to mark all the, the lines on each um, training patch, right? Yeah, yeah, we reviewed, yeah. Otherwise, if you would leave some unmarked, you would probably get much worse results. I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to try, actually, because who knows, maybe it makes the model more robust. With how many patches did you train on? Like a thousand? Yeah, a thousand. Yeah. How much time did it take you to? Uh, what was the number? I think eight hours on TPU. Was that the number? Uh, 
No, 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 to label, to oh, ma label. manually oh, yeah. to label. No, 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 I, mean, to I mean, I think full human time should be maybe two, one, two working days. I, I claim in the presentation eight, but I'm now doubting it a bit. <laughs> I mean, two days. This is with active learning, so you'll take yeah. predictions yeah. so start from scratch. The thing is that the process took longer because I had to develop these ideas first. Uh, but I, I think it should be effectively around, uh, yeah, what I was saying, like uh, eight hours, 16 hours, maybe. Uh, sorry, where is this? No, this is not here. The CPU time. Yeah, oh, where did I? I stated this somewhere. Oh, whatever. Um, yeah. Are you training from scratch at each iteration, or you use the model for the <clears throat> iteration? Oh yeah, good question. I think I was actually, I was reusing the, the previous model, I think. But yeah, but not necessarily. I mean, maybe maybe it doesn't help. I don't know. Uh, I also didn't try like pre-trained models from somebody else. That would be interesting to see. I, yeah. It's just, it's like a big search space, this, uh, this problems. So like, uh, if you have more people to try different things, I think it's definitely nice. Um, yeah, I think if I had like more people available, I would kind of set up a benchmark, like clear input and output, and then like let people try different things for sure. Because like this, I, I, I tried a couple of things and once it works, that uh, worked, I moved on. Right. I mean, you didn't do any experimentation. I mean, once you had the results that were suitable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, surprisingly, the hardest part, uh, well, hardest, one of the hard parts was surprisingly how to do normalization properly. Mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah, the, the range is too big to put into a model. So I was trying to normalize globally. So I would get the mac global maximum and global minimum. And then just normalize to one uh, the whole data. That turned out to destroy too much of the signal. Um, then I tried per tile to normalize, which is also which is then also not good because if the tile has big range, you squash the data more than if it's a flat tile. So you, you could really see that in the results, like some tiles were better than others. Uh, in the end, I ended up with batch normalization, TensorFlow batch normalization. That worked pretty well, but I don't know why. I mean, it's like, it's, yeah, that's life. I mean, because, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you actually learn on a batch, right? Yeah. What right. the grade the answer calculated. That but then, I mean, then your batch shape. How many samples, for instance, were you speaking for batch? And these, they shape, yeah. right? They're not always the same. Let's um, see. Maybe I have the process. I think it was like 32, but I'm not sure. What is this? This is pre-processing now. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm curious as well now. Uh, let's see, the TP1. Uh, maybe here. So at the end, you just feed the model just the raw raw data, or did you do some features? No, it was so one channel. Oh yeah, four. Interesting. Really small. Magic. Um, right. So it was just one channel, and that was. Ah, uh, just one channel. Yeah. So the, these transformations that you did on the training data that just meant that you had more training data in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That just kind of stretches it out. Uh, let we can maybe see where it's called. Yeah, here. Basically, it's like uh, pre-processing. It's external. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, our implementation. Yeah, that was the package. I didn't use that one. I wrote my own stuff. 
So do you Why didn't you use that one actually? Do you remember? Uh, because I just saw it today and it looked yeah, like it. Uh, I wanted to try it. I wanted to try it, so I, I want to have reasons why, why not. Also, uh, it's, it didn't. Maybe that it's becoming a standard. Yeah. It could be. I mean, it maybe looks okay. It, it was pretty active at the time and probably it's different now. I, I don't remember well. I think that kind of didn't fit my pipeline because I wanted to do uh, basically have like a raw data set and then put the augmentation in the pipeline. And the augmentation is like a pure Python thing, I think. Mm. Or is it? It kind of works the same way. I think you just fit it into, you have a transform so function on, on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's on the fly. From what I saw. Yeah, today. I mean, that's what you want to do. And I added writing up my own stuff. Uh, for everything, for all the... Yeah, oh. but it's not oh. that much. I mean, this is remove rolling average, whatever. Deformations here, um, rotation, right? This is rotation. Yeah, at the end, it's, everything is not much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Most it's. Of the, the transformations that you mentioned are already in terms of. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's just matrix operations, right? So this is horizontal flip, rotation. I think this one was the hardest, uh, which was basically. Um, this uh, this elastic deformations, so I created like a Gaussian uh, surface, and then that does the deformation, kind of like the, the the surface tells you how much to stretch into which direction, something like that. I mean, it's a bit of an overkill, but I, I remember that the documentations that it did too many things. Like Wait, so you did this also with these augmentations, so you would stretch and uh, yeah. So that's why it how, that's how the model. It's sort of nonlinear. Yeah, yeah. probably yeah. one of the reasons why it got the, the non-circle stuff. Yeah. 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 Because it it, it worked pretty well. It worked with that too. Because you have some sort of oval or circle yeah. shapes on the, that you're looking for. But if you did that with buildings, I'm not sure because the lines are always straight. No, no, I, I mean, the, yeah, the. The, the, issue, the, the limitation that you had in the beginning, just circles, is yeah. not a true limitation, and you didn't solve it with this. No, thing. yeah, it worked. It just it yeah. Worked. yeah, yeah, it improved because I mean, these convolutions anyway average everything, right? Like it's all fuzzy, so yeah, it it did improve the, the general result, but I didn't notice that it would improve the shapes uh, or something, but. Uh, but then again, like this is all like these feelings and ideas, and so like none of it is measured, right? Let's say I can don't okay. like that. It's, I mean, it's good to try with the circles at the beginning mm -hmm. because it's much faster to to yeah. labor. Yeah, and exactly. We would decide in the beginning. No, we have to yeah. outline correctly. Then, yeah. and I'm pretty sure it would work with boxes as well. I'm I'm like really sure that it would. So, uh, I understand correctly if you would have a bounding box yeah. then you would get a bounding box prediction so you wouldn't you wouldn't get the segmented segmented um, yeah I mean the depends on how you define the problem but I, I was looking at like this mask R thing uh, I don't know if you're familiar like Facebook this did this thing uh, mask prediction, yeah. yeah usually they, they predict just the yeah, just numbers. No, but they also have like a, maybe 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 it's one of the later ones. But there is one that also does segmentation. Mask, mask yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and that one, uh, I think the the original inputs are just bounding boxes. But in this case, yeah, you would have to also have to input segmentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But at least for the mask R thing. Yeah. Hmm. For the other two, you don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Anyway, but it's in, in polygons. It's not the actual. Um, I think. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, it, it works pixel-based, but the annotations. Polygons. Uh, yeah. Okay. For me, it would be a very interesting thing to study how does this active uh, yeah, feedback loop uh, does it actually work? Like to do that mathematically. I mean, it worked for me, but uh, I wonder, like, if I just keep on doing it, will it converge, or is there like a maximum at some point, and then it drops, or you know, uh, it's, but it's like yeah, kind of hairy problem. Um, 
but I think that's an interesting area to study, like academically. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, with this deformation, yeah, this is grid. This is the elastic one, and it's all pure tensor flow. I guess that's made it that made it faster, and then I just use it here. Um, yeah. I mean, argumentations, if they got, uh, if they wrote it in TensorFlow, then it would be fast too, and it would be just fine. And it's always nice to rely on a library that's maintained by somebody else. <laughs> that's always <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Uh, no, no, yeah. uh, let's see, I mean, I'm really curious about the, the team working on this. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Four days ago, two days ago. Okay, so it's okay. alive. Uh, but then the question is, how many committers? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Was of four thousand stars and five hundred forks. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty decent. Um, and like, if you need to do labeling, I would advise to look at this label studio. Uh, I, I will share the presentation, and in the presentation there's these links, uh, these things. Uh, Label Studio people, like, uh, basically they reached out to me, I don't know why. I think they saw my package on GitHub, and they reached out, and they just, they want to build an ecosystem around their package. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, they, but they might die because they're a startup. So. <laughs> but, but at least, like the the kind of the, the interface and so looks pretty good. I mean, this I really like this that I can get a fa uh, an interface very fast, right? Uh, this is this is great if you need to do labeling. But at some point, uh, these offerings become payable. So if yeah. I have something public, or I was looking into this a couple of months ago, and if you have a limited number of samples to label, yeah. then it's free and it's fine, but if you go past that point, yeah. it becomes a payable service. And I, I think, I mean, at least with, with these guys, I think you can basically run it as, a, as their package locally, okay. and it's fine. And then if you want to offload the, the ops of running that thing to somebody else, or, or have other people work through them, you know, just to make your work simpler than, than you offload to them. I think that's their idea, uh, because it just makes it easier to get new clients in that way. Others are more aggressive with sales, like Prodigy, I think, yeah, uh, you immediately, it's all SaaS and you have to pay very soon. Um, Amazon also is not that bad, I think, the SageMaker thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the costs are related to it, but... I think uh, it's quite it might even be free. I think like the just the labeling part, but then they offer a marketplace of people that label for you. No, but isn't that the different thing? Isn't that uh, mechanical yeah. Turk? There, no, there's no. that, but there's you this is another thing. A labeling campaign, and mm -hmm. then you decide whether you want to use mechanical terms for that. Mm -hmm. Oh. Or you can make a private team, and you actually invite people just by emails, and they get a link. Click and oh. join the campaign, and it's not a label, and that's it. Okay. So, so it's this, uh, yeah, ground truth thing. Uh, so you create a labeling job, uh, and these are task types, yeah. So for us, it would be this one. Uh, yeah. So you could, and I wonder, like, okay, ground truth pricing, right? Those that I mean, one you, hour to figure out how much. Uh, you use um, S3, you, at the end, you probably uh, they use SageMaker and things like that. So it's and you pay for the instant. No, no, no. Per label. So it's okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, this uh, once you're in this area, it gets uh, tricky probably because then your your business is really reliant on this and it gets harder to move away. But still, it's probably not no, that but bad. Eight cents for an object. Is it per pixel? Oh wait, what? <laughs> oh no, you're right. Yeah. It's not that cheap, huh? Yeah, no, it's you yeah, have right. The hundred thousand of them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I thought this was total, but yeah, per per object, this is yeah much. Yeah. 
but this is if you pay for the certification done. Oh, probably by humans, you mean? Yeah. Oh, oh, mechanical Turk. Uh, uh, oh, no. That are labeled, yeah, it doesn't say who labeled them. Do you think more for passing for labeling with Amazon Turk? It's later on. Yeah. So like it's, it's cheaper? It's it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> How? No, but this is probably just to keep an object labeled, right? Probably. First two months are free. <laughs> and we have one month to do the detection anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not cheap, this thing, yeah, okay. Oh, then, I, yeah, whatever. Uh, but like uh, this, the these guys, these are really approachable. Like I can give you the email of the guy. I mean, and the, the thing looks solid. And also, Prodigy used to have something open source, I think. And basically, you run the server locally. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Think about it. 